On behalf of the American Heart Association, I would like to welcome you to today's panel discussion, Advocating for Patients Experiencing Pain, Strategies for Inpatient Nurses. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review how to use this platform for today's event. If you experience any technical difficulties, most user issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser. If that does not work, please review the system requirements or contact the Zoom webinar helpline. Throughout today's discussion, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our panelists using the questions feature on your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time, and we will review the questions during our Q&A at the end as time allows. By email tomorrow, you will receive an invitation to complete our feedback survey. This presentation will be recorded and available within the coming weeks at heart.org forward slash pain management. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Tracy Malik Cyril is an adult nurse practitioner with over 25 years experience at Stanford Healthcare in Palo Alto, California. She received her graduate degree from the University of California, San Francisco. Her current clinical practice within the Division of Pain Medicine focuses primarily on evaluation and treatment of individuals suffering from acute and chronic pain conditions in both the acute care and outpatient settings. Tracy is a nationally recognized clinician, speaker, author, and thought leader in the field of pain management. And she has been recognized by the Point of Care Network as one of America's top nurse practitioners in pain management. Next, we have Dr. Robert Montgomery, a clinical nurse specialist with the acute pain service in the Department of Anesthesiology at University of Colorado Hospital. He received his doctorate of nursing practice from the University of Colorado, where he holds a clinical faculty appointment as associate professor of anesthesiology. He is the clinical coordinator of the acute pain service for the hospital and is adjunct associate professor in the University of Colorado College of Nursing where he teaches in the Clinical Nurse Specialist Program. Dr. Montgomery has lectured both locally and nationally, and he is a 2005 Colorado Florence Nightingale Award recipient. Also joining us today is Michelle Philman, a nurse practitioner who is currently working for an inpatient acute pain service at Christus St. Vincent's Regional Medical Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has a background of 18 years of bedside nursing, practicing in cardiothoracic units, surgical trauma, and medical surgical ICUs. For the last 15 years, she has been an inpatient pain service nurse practitioner. Her pain management journey began in 2008 when she started her first inpatient pain service at St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver, Colorado. From there, she continued her inpatient pain management journey at Stanford Healthcare in Palo Alto, California, learning and practicing there for six years before joining Christus St. Vincent's Regional Medical Center in 2018. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Valerie Diaz. Valerie is a registered nurse with over 21 years of nursing experience. She received her associate degree in nursing from Bakersfield College in Bakersfield, California, and started her nursing career in adult critical care. She transitioned to informatics as a clinical information system coordinator and was recognized as a subject matter expert. She obtained her bachelor's from California State University, Bakersfield, and a public health nursing license in 2016. In 2020, Valerie moved back to Bakersfield Memorial Hospital to use her clinical knowledge and project management experience to manage their chest pain program. She holds cardiac vascular board certifications and is currently working on her master's degree in healthcare administration. She is an active member in cardiovascular and cardiac rehabilitation associations. Valerie, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, everybody, um, um, on our uh, call, uh, Zoom call today. I'm really excited. We have some um, great panelists that we'll be speaking to. I have um, prepared a list of questions for us to go through today, and uh, let's get started. So, um, Rob, we're going to start with you. I have a, a, a fun question here. It's a we're going to, I'm going to read over a couple questions for you, but it's like a part one and part two. So we'll just do it all at once and, um, and let's see how it goes. So, you know, in your daily work, um, you're very familiar with pain assessments and reassessments for patients in the hospital. 
Um, can you share with us some strategies uh, healthcare professionals can use when conducting a pain assessment upon the initial intake and then the reassessment um, after treatment? And the part two of this question would be for those patients with comorbidities like hypertension, what might um, we do differently for these types of patients when we're talking about pain? Thanks, Valerie. Uh, my pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, and I'll be speaking for about the next 10 minutes on, on answering these questions. Uh, I'd like to actually take that second question because I think I can answer it pretty briefly. Uh, I'll take that question first, which is, um, if uh, patients with um, hypertension, would I do anything different for their pain assessment? And the simple answer is no. Um, I would, patients with a comorbidity like hypertension, I would, uh, I would do, you go through the normal process of doing that initial pain intake pain assessment and then conduct ongoing reassessment similarly to the other patients that I would, uh, similarly to other patients. I might uh, you know, take a, a little bit more time to focus in on their analgesics that they may be using or their knowledge of them, particularly around the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, uh, because of the complexities and implications they have with patients with hypertension. Um, so coming back to the first question about strategies around pain assessment and reassessment. Uh, and, you know, our practice, my practice is in acute care. I've been in that setting forever. I've been through the, the process of implementing pain assessment tools years ago, uh, hope, trying to get those tools refined for our nurses so that they're easy to use and easy to, uh, um, you know, make a part of their daily work of their physical assessment. So, you know, in today's times, those tools are very integrated into what nurses do every day. And uh, they can be very useful uh, in, in most situations. The, the simple way that we assess pain in acute care is primarily using a tool that looks at a number of parameters. Um, I, I'll give an example of the tool we use in my institution, which is called the WILDA tool, which stands for words, intensity, location, duration, and aggravating and alleviating factors. And really what that all those uh, terms uh, do for us is they kind of look at three components of uh, a patient's pain report, which is location, where is it, nature, quality, and characteristics, and then how much pain, what's the intensity of the pain. And pretty much any tool you're going to use typically will look at those, those uh, parameters. Uh, and, and it's the pain intensity parameter that we're following over time Typically, we're following all those all those elements, but it's the pain intensity that we're typically asking um, on a on a sequential basis over time during a patient's hospital stay. The other pieces of the nature, quality, and characteristics and location, you know, if they change over time, well, then we would reassess it. But usually, nurses are carrying that through in their documentation in the chart. So it's that intensity rating that we're looking at regularly. And for assessing what I would call simple pain pain that we encounter, that patients encounter in the hospital from surgery uh, or if uh, from injury, I, I actually kind of identify those as simple pain because we usually know where they hurt and why they hurt. And we have an expectation of how much they should hurt. We have an understanding that having a surgery for a carpal tunnel release is very different uh, in pain intensity than having a thoracotomy surgery or um, uh, uh, you know, a major abdominal surgery where the intensity of pain is much greater. We sort of have an understanding for that. So using pain intensity scales with patients in those, in those settings um, is uh, uh, very understandable to us, usually understandable to the patient. Um, the problem is that uh, using kind of one parameter over time to get at a person's pain is not really a full picture of their pain, right? Pain is very complex. And then um, uh, uh, it can, uh, when patients don't, um, you know, give us the responses that we are expecting, then things become more complicated. But in general, that intensity score allows us to follow the patient's pain over time and um, to determine if our interventions are being effective to help, help treat their pain. And interventions can be anything from repositioning, you know, uh, 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 over-the-counter analgesic, a prescription level tablet, an IV injection, uh, heat, ice, relaxation, all of that are interventions that we can use and implement and follow that pain over time. And for most patients, this works fine. They take the medicines that, that um, we know will work. They work. 
pain gets better over time and they heal up and they get discharged. <clears throat> um, and in intensity, so, um, so that's kind of the simple process. So where, where are some strategies within that? Well, we've all run into patients who say, I'm tired of you asking me about my pain. I don't like the zero to 10. I don't know what a three is. I don't know what a seven is. I'd rather use words. I don't like words. I don't like mild. What is mild? What is moderate? So, so it's really our job to help them understand these things and hopefully um, in a way that allows them to effectively use them. But keep in mind, you always want to meet patients where they are. And if they really don't want to use the zero to 10, well, don't use it. Use a, um, use a verbal descriptor scale, mild, moderate, mild, moderate, or severe. Or I've even run into patients who don't want to use any scale. And so I'll tell them, okay, well, then, uh, then there's only three things, you know, answers that you could give to me. Uh, no pain, pain tolerable, pain intolerable. And if your pain's tolerable, I don't care what level it is. If you can tolerate it and you can do what you need to do to get out of bed and activities of recovery, uh, deep breathe, cough, participate in therapy, great. If, um, if it's intolerable, well, then that's a conversation. And that's where things um, you know, can take more time with patients. But the problem with nursing is that we, if we don't really have you know, tools to respond to that or responses for it, then we, we feel a little um, uh, powerless and helpless and frustrated. And that's where, you know, we don't want, I never want any of the nurses I interact with to, to feel like that. So um, uh, those can be just more complicated situations. That's another hour long talk. <laughs> um, but I guess a strategy is to try to meet the patient where they are and use whatever is useful to them. Um, another part of the pain assessment is the comfort function goal, or what a lot of people call the pain goal. Our institution decided to call it the comfort function goal because that's the goal that they can have sufficient comfort or sufficient function. You know, is that a two for them? Is that a seven for them? You know, it's the, it's the variability in the nature of pain and patients' responses that some can do fine at a seven and some can do fine at a two. Um, but that is hopefully useful to us in identifying it and working towards that. And if the patient wants to change that at any point in time, then they get to change that. And, um, uh, and, um, so we need to be willing to accept that. So simple intensity scores, simple tools can work most of the time. But then we run into patients with complex pain problems, chronic pain, persistent pain that's been there for a long time, maybe not treated well in the past. Now they're an inpatient. Maybe they're in for that pain problem. Maybe they're in for another problem. But then that presents a whole nother challenge because we're trying to take a tool that's really directed towards simple pain types and apply it in, to these patients, which doesn't work well a lot of the times. Pain is so complex that just to, to try to label it with a number doesn't really get at what that person's experience of pain is. Again, we're kind of lacking tools to help patients with this in the inpatient setting, um, so it, it frustrates us. Um, but you know, those complexities are long-standing persistent pain, pain of unknown etiology, uh, um, pain that responds poorly to analgesics, our standards, standard analgesics, uh, neuropathic pain and complex pain um, also falls into that category. So those are all can be, can be very difficult in the inpatient setting. One of the tools or strategies that can be used is with those patients perhaps to function more on activity and function than really the pain score. Once again, if that person can get up out of bed at an eight and do what they need to do, well then okay. You know, we'll work over time to get a person down to maybe a five or a four or a six, um, but, you know, it, it's not something that we're going to achieve immediately. Coming back to that pain goal, comfort function goal, um, that also recognizes that the goal is not to eliminate pain completely on a patient, recognizing that, yes, there's going to be some level of pain, but what is it, um, well, hopefully what number can allow you, the patient, to get out of bed deep breathe and cough, and do typically on the inpatient setting what I call activities of recovery. I know I've got a few more seconds left. Um, I do want to mention a tool that's been tested and implemented in some acute care settings called CAPA, Clinically Aligned Pain Assessment Tool. And this is created by nursing and is attempt by, an attempt by nursing to use a more valid tool to cover all types of pain in a hospital. And it looks at parameters like comfort, change in pain, pain control level, function and sleep. Um, so that is one area where nursing is really 
you know, trying to push the boundaries and try to get new tools into place to help us in the acute care setting. Well, that was like a whole lot of information in a, in a short period of time, but I really appreciate, I think, everything you were um, saying and giving us strategies. I know as a bedside nurse, uh, a lot of the things you talked about is was a struggle. I think you've given some great uh, information um, for bedside nurses, too, with patients with chronic pain. Um, I think even just the basic, you know, we get um, a number from um, either like if you're on a floor from a care partner or nurse um, CNA that gives you a score, um, but really showing that nurses need to do a little investigation on um, the location of pain and that intensity. Um, I think some of the other really th uh, great things I heard you say is, you know, calling it um, a comfort a function goal. Um, definitely making that individualized um, for that patient so that we're not just treating a number, we're, we're treating what we need to for that individual patient to do the things that they need to do. And like you said, we're activities of recovery. So yeah, yeah that was wonderful. I mean, I've been a nurse for a long time and you've said some things that um, I've actually never really heard recently. So um, definitely wanna share that information with my colleagues. Um, Tracy, did you have a comment? I, I have a question. Oh, question. Um, thank you. That was very, that was very informative. Um, question for you. The very first scale that you had talked about, so the Kappa scale, I, I'm not familiar with. I would love to start implementing that into my institution, but the very first one that you talked about, um, is that a formalized scale or is that just something that you implemented at University of Colorado mm -hmm. for your team? The Wilda, are you afraid to the yeah. Wilda? Okay. Yeah, yeah Wilda, W-I. No, it's been published. It was created by um, Dr. Regina Fink, a uh, um, clinical nurse specialist on the pain service prior to me, who went oh. on to become a PhD and do research on her tool. Um, it is just taking, you know, kind of an acronym around pain assessment. That was what she used to use at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And um, it just includes, you know, the, the basic parameters and the intensity scale. And she created it so she, a mnemonic, so she could remember it when she went and did pain assessments for patients and then decided that she published it, tested it. It was valid because it's using all kind of valid uh, uh, parameters. And um, we implemented it into our charting system many years ago. Now, one thing that I that I would really love to advocate for, and this kind of goes, you know, beyond the scope of this lecture, but wouldn't it be great to have the nurses in the audience take these tools and, you know, do a little pilot study in their institutions on, you know, how they work? Mm -hmm. I think I know at Stanford, we're really trying to beef up the um, support of our bedside nurses to really get more involved in research. And I think simple tools like this, just taking a handful of patients, starting with a pilot project and and, you know, publish a poster or publish it at a, a, a local conference. I agree. I definitely agree with you. I think I will be taking this to our shared governance um, um, committee meetings and talking with our nurses to see if somebody's interested in, in actually taking this to the bedside and seeing the effectiveness and the change um, and the impact for the patient. So that was great. And now, um, Tracy, this is perfect segue onto, um, I have some questions for you as well. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, and we will also be, um, you know, kind of asking questions towards the end. So we'll bring all our panels back together. So if we have any more questions um, on this topic. So um, Tracy, so <clears throat> I have um, <clears throat> some questions. So with healthcare pro uh, but professionals, um, including nursing, uh, often work in stressful environments um, in the hospital, you know, in the hospital setting, which can be difficult to recognize our own personal biases. Um, from your experience, how are these how are these personal biases affecting the care of a patient when it comes when it's unrecognized? So I know different areas like ED, um, you know, ICU, or even just med surge areas. They're all different. They all have different, you know, um, stressors. But how is these uh, um, how are these personal biases affecting our care? Yeah, thank you, Valerie. That's a great question. You know, and I think it's a very timely question too because. We're just segueing out of you know three years of on top of the normal daily stress with COVID and everything that we're trying to 
navigate, you know, as healthcare providers, particularly bedside nurses. So this is a great question um, for this uh, webinar. So as individuals, I think you have to understand that we all have personal biases, right? We're human. We come to our lives, our work, our jobs, our interactions with our family and friends with conscious and unconscious bias. And I think that it's okay, and it's actually more than okay, it's important to recognize that you carry bias into everything that you do. I think, and we'll talk about this, you know, in, in maybe the second half of my discussion about, you know, the importance of not the tools that you need to try and really navigate around these biases that you have. But I think first and foremost, recognize that you as an individual come to the come to each interaction um, with your patients, with your family, with employers, bringing conscious and unconscious bias to the table. So embrace that, recognize that, um, but pay attention, you know, to those biases when you're when you're uh, interacting, because it, sometimes it's appropriate to to uh, maybe act on um, some of those preconceived notions because um, they can be your little, you know, kind of light in the back of your head that says I need to pay more attention, and sometimes they really can be detrimental. Uh, to the care that you're trying to give uh, the patients. So just simply being cognizant helps you be mindful in how you approach your patients' situations, the decisions about care, uh, and your daily day interactions. When we try and deny biases, ignore them, fail to recognize them, it affects all aspects of care. And I'll give you an example. So say you're um, interacting with a patient and you have a medication that is um, listed as a PRN medication whatever it is uh, for a patient in pain. And um, you come to the um, interaction thinking that, you know, you have this understanding of what pain is in a given situation, right? Um, Rob talked about the differences in the thoracotomy versus say a, um, a knee replacement although those are both very painful procedures. But you know what I'm saying? You look at different procedures and, and if you come to the table thinking that, you know, oh, I had that procedure and it wasn't that painful or I've taken care of 10 patients that had that procedure and that wasn't that painful. So even though the patient's asking for medications that I have available as a PRN, I'm gonna choose not to necessarily advocate for that patient and, and treat them as maybe they should be treated or another provider would treat them because of the, uh, the biases I have on how much pain they're really having. So believing the patient within a safe you know, parameter um, and, and, and drive your clinical decisions in that way, right? Don't, don't, don't understand that you have the biases and try not to um, really stamp uh, every patient according to what you think is appropriate. And again, we'll talk about this. I don't want to um, steal your thunder, Valerie, with, with maybe some additional questions that you have. But I think when you're in a situation and that little light's going on behind you, is this really a situation that I'm inflicting my personal bias on? Or you know, is there really a situation where I shouldn't be giving that patient that PRN medication because it's unsafe? You know, seek out your colleagues, seek out um, some of your peers and, and, and get opinions from them about what they might do in the similar situation. Well, that, that's good. Those are good points. And I think that, um, you know, I, from a cardiac background now with chest pain, some of the things that we like to teach, especially with, um, is that we have special populations, right? So patients that present with chest pain, um, a female doesn't present the same as a male. Um, and elderly don't present the same in even the descriptors of their chest pain. And um, like you said, they don't always come in with that crushing chest pain with their hand to their fist. So, um, but we can miss heart attacks if we don't exactly what you said, listen to the patient. And tying into Rob, also understanding all of those pieces and um, really investigating the pain, you know, understanding um, the descriptors and the quality uh, in addition to just that um, statement of I'm in pain. So, you know, that's <clears throat> important information and that's very helpful so um, that we care for our patients. Um, the second part of my uh, question here is, what are some of the simple tools that we can use to recognize or overcome these personal biases in, in, a tr in the treatment of patients? 
Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, it's a great segue question. Um, I think that, again, first and foremost, um, and I'm on my soapbox, is to recognize that you have biases. You bring biases to the table. And so just paying attention to that, listening to, you know, those biases and trying to overcome, I mean, use them if they're appropriate in the situation. We all come with experiences. Let's change, let's change the term biases to personal experiences, right? Mm -hmm. We all come with personal experiences in everything that we do. So understanding, really kind of doing a self-check and understanding when those personal experiences meet the situation when they do not. And sometimes it's a matter of just using, you know, validated tools, following a, a, a protocol that's in front of you to really get the information that you need to get. So, you know, there's lack of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So firstly, it's to recognize, right, some introspection and look at um, yourself, how you've approached different situations. And, and again, as you become a more experienced nurse, a lot of this is automatic, right? So as a, an experienced nurse, I think you just start your treatment, your job, what you're doing in, in an automatic fashion. And I think it's even more challenging for those with years of experience, even though they bring a lot of, you know, uh, to the table with their treatment to actually undo that and say, oh yeah, wait a minute, maybe you know, it, that's not the situation anymore. So understanding and, and again, be introspective in that regard. The golden rule, right? Um, treat others the way you would wanna be treated or that you would want your family to be taken care of um, or you would want to um, be treated from a person on the street. So you, um, you know, it's, it's perspective taking. So considering experiences, from the point of view of the person that is being stereotyped, right? Or the, the person that's in front of you, think about their personal experiences. Again, it's kind of taking away what you're bringing to the table and your experiences, but it's really looking at them from, from what, they, what they are right in front of you. Um, and you can do this by, you know, looking at reading, watching content that discuss, get to know a little bit about the culture of the population you're taking care of. Um, listening to others, right? Hearing the message. Um, what are patients saying to you? And, and is their messaging really the words they're saying or is there something behind that messaging that you need to attune to? Um, and again, understanding, again, you're using your own personal experiences. Are, um, are you hearing the message that actually is coming out of their mouth? Um, and I said this uh, previously, but but if you're in a situation where it just doesn't seem right, or you're you're on autopilot, or again, you know, you, you get an intuition. I mean, I think nurses go into nursing because they have not only a passion to take care of patients and to and to heal and to you know be compassionate, but also um, being able to uh, kind of check. Um, with others around you in terms of is this am I hearing this correctly am I doing the right thing am I um, you know am I really taking care of this patient the way I should have um, or am, have I just gotten into a situation where I'm doing autopilot and and uh, using my past perceptions of um, the way I've treated patients before yeah um, I have something that might be helpful uh, a way to think about it. So we have a lot of opioid use disorder addiction patients here in, as does everybody, it's a pretty prevalent yeah. here in, in New Mexico. But um, I try to get the nurses to think about those patients as a chronic, as a chronic patient. It is a chronic, um, a chronic disease process that will need lifelong medication and treatment, just like an insulin dependent diabetic or a patient who has hypertension. And sometimes when you phrase it like that, people are just like, oh, you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's just a chronic disease process that's really not any different than any other chronic disease process that needs lifelong treatment. Right, no, I think so that's that can be great... helpful to think yeah. about it like that. Yeah, so, so I, taking away from, um, you know, what you've uh, said, I think that you make two really great points um, just off the top, and that's number one, um, I need to recognize that even if I try not to have biases, I do, right? I just have to understand that there is a filter that I take in um, as a nurse. And I think second um, big point you make is experience can be my friend and my enemy when it comes to biases. And 
Um, I think that for nurses, um, if you had a scary experience where you gave somebody something and it was a bad outcome, you tend to be a little shy the next time with a different um, scenario. So, um, and not, not that the two scenarios will play out the same. So yeah. I, I think um, you make some really good points as it's hearing the patient, really understanding that patient and then applying my knowledge and my expertise to that situation um, so that patient gets the best treatment possible. Yeah, and I just want to, um, I just want to end with one one additional comment about tools. I think, you know, understanding um, the culture of the um, the group that you're interacting with is really important, um, but also not falling into that pattern of assuming that all folks from a certain cultural background have the same experiences, right? So again, individualizing your care to the patient within the realm of safety and, and listening to your patient. Um, but, but, but being mindful of, you know, the culture. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's a great topic to discuss. Um, you know, that uh, is something that we all, I think, you know, can, it's just a growing and ongoing um, piece that we learn as, as bedside, you know, professionals. And so thank you. That was a very, very good topic to talk about. And, and definitely, I think you, you mentioned like doing some more research on the area too and understanding our population. Um, okay, perfect. So um, Michelle, I have some questions for you. Um, so <clears throat> kind of moving on a little bit, but so nurses um, play a key role in the treatment and management of patients' pain. And um, there is a multimodal approach um, that can help reduce patients' um, pain levels. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you we use that multimodal approach? And then I have a kind of a piggyback question onto that. And um, how do we educate um, our patients on the various medications they are taking? Um, and how does that influence the shared decision making? I'd be happy to answer that question. Um, really, this is like an hour long discussion. So I am going to breeze through this. So let's just talk about multimodal for a second and what that means. That really encompasses medications and interventions. And interventions can include things like um, physical therapy and occupational therapy, things that patients don't always think are going to help their pain. So, um, and we really have to uh, have them understand that it's just not the medication the medications that are going to help them get over their uh, pain issues. So let's just talk about um, the medications for a few minutes here. So uh, some of the strategies that nurses can use is that providers will sometimes order the acetaminophen as needed on a PRN basis. It's really helpful to get that scheduled. So if that's scheduled and you're bringing in the tablet to the patient and they're like, oh no, acetaminophen does not help me. It doesn't help my pain at all, which is a lot of what patients say. And the strategy for that is to explain to them that it hits a different receptor in their brain and it can help the other medications that you're giving them work better. The second medication that is really helpful, um, especially in post-surgical or acute pain is NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Of course, um, heart patients need to be careful about taking some of those medications. So I always advocate for that to be scheduled at the lowest dose possible. Some, just some, av you know, it's a little bit, um, you have to just be a little bit more careful with the ibuprofen because it can affect um, uh, like plate, it can affect your platelets and, and it can affect kidney function. So you really have to be mindful of the patient's labs and what uh, anticoagulation that they might be on, especially our heart patients. So having that scheduled, um, especially around meals, can be really effective along with the acetaminophen to uh, help the pain reduce and for our patients to use less opioids. And that's a lot of what this multimodal strategy is about, using less opioids uh, for the patients. Then the other group of meds I'd like to talk about is gabapentinoids. So that would be gabapentin or Lyrica. Um, and those medications can be effective in helping some of that nervy pain, especially after surgery. Of course, when a surgeon cuts or um, you have an injury, those uh, nerve endings are kind of angry and that gabapentin can help get that uh, kind of calm down and it hits a different receptor for pain. The, um, the things about gabapentin is it can make, especially our elderly patients, 
it can make um, them feel a little bit dizzy or confused or like they've had a glass of wine um, or very sleepy. So if they're having some strategies around the gabapentin, if it's making them sleepy, you can uh, stop the daytime dosing and just use it at night because it can help them, them rest at night, which of course, all of our patients in the hospital do have a hard time with that. So uh, those are the three medications that end up getting sort of scheduled for patients in a multimodal uh, pain, a pain panel. The other one, plus or minus, are muscle relaxers. So depending on the injury, rib fractures, um, after a motor vehicle accident or things like that, or even after abdominal surgery, a lot of times those muscles are very cramping and spasmatic. So um, some of the medications that you might see used for that are Robaxin, um, which is a little, in my mind, it's, and in my experience, it's a little less, um, it doesn't affect the sleepiness and confusion like Plexeril might. People use a lot of, you know, that's a more common medication that we're more uh, used to, but Robaxin is nice because it can help those spasms and not affect uh, the sleepiness or the mentation of the patient as much. Um, and then baclofen is also a nice one that can be used. Soma we don't use anymore. It's very addicted, addicting. So um, that is not a drug that we use anymore. So that can be a plus or minus, and that could be scheduled as well, just to help the patient really get comfortable, be able to work with physical therapy um, and get out of bed and do the things they need to do to get better, which is what Rob um, alluded to with his comfort uh, scale. That's, that is our goal with multimodal, is to be able for the patient to really work with physical therapy and do the things that they need to do to get better while understanding that their pain is never going to be really zero. The other, other strategy, um, this is part of what I call mojo, which is part of my uh, multimodal interventions. So the mojo around some of this is to really explain to the patient, this surgical pain is going to get better. Sometimes patients, this is the first time they've ever had surgery or been in a car accident. And maybe, you know, they're really afraid and they're like, oh my God, this is what it's going to be like forever. And you really have to encourage them and really you know, even if they just get to the side of the bed, like you did a great job, it's really hard after abdominal surgery or you have all these ribs broken and really encourage them that this pain is acute pain that can get better. Um, and really have them understand that physical therapy is part of that intervention and part of the multimodal plan to help them get better. Now, some of the other interventions, um, nurses are really good about offering ice packs, never underestimate um, the power of an ice pack. It can be very anti-inflammatory. Sometimes heat can be comforting, but for surgical patients, a lot of that pain is from the inflammation process of having the surgery. So ice packs are usually more um, appropriate for that, but sometimes patients, surgery patients come in with chronic back pain and a heating pad might be very comforting for that chronic pain that has now exacerbated because of their surgery. So nurses are very good about the, the heat packs and the ice packs, repositioning for, um, for pain, getting out of bed. Um, patients usually aren't used to being in bed all day long. So like that getting out of bed, um, nurses are very like, you know, they are first line for those, those kind of interventions and they should not be underestimated. Um, then the other things, the other interventions that are a little bit more evasive that I just want to touch on are things like that our anesthesiologists can help us with like epidurals for big abdominal pain surgeries. Um, there's some caveats around that. If the patient is anticoagulated, they can't get that. Um, they can cause some blood pressure issues, but patients can really get good pain control after a large abdominal surgery with an epidural, and that can allow them to get out of bed, use an incentive spirometer, um, and just be more functional than um, having just the opioids. And then a couple other things. I only have two minutes left. See, I told you it was an hour. Um, an hour talk, um, are some of the peripheral nerve catheters that our anesthesiologists can place uh, for limbs, uh, like intrascalenes or adductor canal catheters for total knees that can really provide a lot of non-opioid pain relief and reduce the amount of opioids patients can have. Um, the, some of the volume catheters that they're placing right now are erector spinae catheters, not to be confused with an epidural, even though it's kind of in the same place, um, those can be very good for thoracotomy incisions and for um, rib fractures. 
And then uh, trans uh, abdominal pain catheters can be very good also for um, big abdominal surgeries. So those are, in a nutshell, those are kind of the non-opioid uh, multimodal interventions that uh, are available to us um, and to nursing. So I am, mm -hmm. I think I'm out of time. No, uh, that was very informative. And I think, you know, you, I think you linked a lot of things together when we talk about um, interdisciplinary care, when we, um, I think when I think multimodal, I don't think I was thinking the interdisciplinary care. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because, you know, um, sometimes you are, have that aches and pains from being in bed, which is related to the surgery and just getting somebody out of bed to a chair or walking down the hall. Um, reduces their overall pain level, mm -hmm. and you can then yeah. figure out well, how do I need to treat that surgical um, pain because um, we've now relieved that other pain, and they're not overwhelmed with all these different types of aches and pains. Um, that you know, I think that was a eye-opening you know conversation. I don't think we think of that. Sometimes we think of those are the tasks in the day that are going to occur. Um, Tracy, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, I um, a couple of things. So thank you, Michelle. That was really, that was an excellent presentation in 10 minutes <laughs> condensed. Um, you know, I think one of the things too, and, and I don't know so much at small regional institutions, I think we're seeing this definitely in bigger academic institutions, partly, um, is this whole idea about not only getting together all of the disciplines within the acute care setting that you can, but starting to even before the surgery is planned, if it is a planned surgery, and communicating with the anesthesia pre-op folks, and Rob, I know that you do this, but also the primary care providers or the team that's going to that inherit this patient when they leave the hospital, starting to get them engaged. Um, particularly if a patient's a chronic pain patient to begin with, to start having different strategies that then, you know, can, you can communicate with nursing in terms of like, this is a chronic pain patient that has low back pain. Now they're going to come in for a knee replacement, even though we're getting knee replacements up the same day, but you know, you're not, you're going to treat these patients a little bit differently. And if you have that education, that information before the patient even comes in for their planned surgery, I think your outcomes are going to be so much better. Yeah. The other um, the other thing that I do just to from two two points just to help engage that the patient is that if they do come in on pain medications really ask so if they are coming in on pain medications the prescription is one thing how they take it is some other is some other thing so really find out how they how do you take this pain medicine medicine at home mm -hmm. and if they have experience with pain like what works for you. And then really like try to work work with them with that so that they really feel like they're heard and they're not you're not just throwing like your cook you know your cookie cutter plan at them. Oh, and then the other thing that I always tell patients if they go home with opioids, I always do the opioids um, safe handling talk. So, and I just really want to get that out there because this is what I tell all the patients whether you're 17 or 107. So no selling, no sharing, no trading, mm -hmm. that the pain medicine, that pain medicine is only for them to keep it in a safe place where people, where kids, pets, or people who may want to steal it from you can't get it. And that if they have any opioids at the end and when they don't need them anymore to take them to a take back pharmacy or the police, the fire stations do it here okay. um, and just get it out of their house because it's not safe to have it in their house. Absolutely. I'm getting weepy. I'm sorry. I think that is so awesome. Oh, so, so I, um, and Misha, uh, maybe I'll finish this off just yeah. real quick. You know, all the years that I've been doing pain management in the hospital, you know, with uh, the approach to multimodal, which is the term that's been around for 20 years now, mm -hmm. I've condensed it down to this. For opioid naive patients who are coming in the hospital, our goal, RNs, doctors, you know, PAs, whoever, NPs, is to minimize their opioid exposure mm -hmm. to the greatest degree possible. Mm -hmm. Because when they have pain that needs, needs that level of treatment, they're going to get opioids. Let's do everything we can to minimize it, maybe even eliminate it, but typically not, but minimize their exposure. Mm -hmm. And that's one category. The second category is opioid tolerant patients who come in the hospital already on opioids. Mm -hmm. The goal is to minimize opioid 
instead of um, minim, uh, exposure, minimize <laughs> escalation. Because mm -hmm. we know yeah. they're going to stay on opioids. We know we're going to have to give them opioids. But let's minimize. Let's do everything we can, blocks, pills, interventions, to minimize how much we have to escalate. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So this is perfect. So now that we have you guys all, I have one more question. I'm going to open it up um, to all our panelists. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the bedside nurses and um, interactions and conversations with physicians and all those different topics we're talking about here. So um, a bedside nurse um, is has key information regarding this patient um, types of pain and the response to the medication interventions, as we were saying. Um, how can a nurse use this information effectively to communicate the patient's needs with other team members so that we can um, have the correct level of treatment that is provided to manage that um, pain appropriately? And I think we kind of were touching on that. And so this is a good segue question. Um, the nurses are with that patient, the, you know, a 12 hour shift, mm -hmm. and they're knowing what's working and what's not working um, oftentimes, or, you know, so communicating with the docs, how, how can we, um, you know, what, what information can you guys give us? Um, I would say what strategies or techniques um, can be useful for this to happen? I think first and foremost, every July, we should have an hour education by the staff nurses to the residents <laughs> that are coming to write orders on the patients to make sure that, you know, there's open lines of communication. I mean, I think the one thing that I can say is that because I've been, you know, as we all have, you know, we've been there. We've been, you know, that first year new grad at the bedside. We, you know, and, and we've done lots of things in our careers. I think knowing the importance and the value at as the bedside nurse that you bring to the interaction you're number one the patient advocate number two you are there to um, interact and be the eyes the ears um, the emotions of that patient to the rest of the hospital staff including the surgeons and the physicians and the um, intensivists and so don't feel um, that you don't have the same responsibility and feel and feel um, opened and and appropriate to bring up your concerns, your issues, to take the best care of that patient that you can. Right? I think just don't feel intimidated. Go ahead. And I think it helps too if you have because you get a little nervous, maybe you know, um, talking to some of the surgeons or. Um, so, uh, does anybody use SOAP, that subjective assessment and plan, when speaking to um, a physician? So, I think if you have that in your head ahead of time, I think that helps you be a little bit more succinct about what um, what is needed and right. what how the patient is presenting to you. And um, if you use, and it's just, I think physicians really appreciate it if you can do it in a very stepwise, succinct um discussion yeah yeah and i've tried this uh, i'm sorry yeah i i would contribute by saying that um you know being ready to to respond to the questions right well have you given them everything that's ordered yes yeah. um uh you know my questions that i ask nurses that that are helpful you know if they're on opioids um are they taking all of their doses are they appearing as if they're over medicated you know, are they sedated? Are they falling asleep? You know, um, are they cognitively impaired from the opioids? No, no, and no. Well, then that gives me information to, to make me feel comfortable from being afar over a phone or through chat that maybe I can increase their opioids to a, to a, uh, a higher level. Um, what Mish touched on before in knowing their, their um, analgesic history, which not every bedside nurse has enough time to glean through the chart and look that up, but just go ask the patient, you know, they're, they're given 90 oxycodone tablets a month and they use them all up in the first, you know, 15 days. Yep. Well, that's not really, you know, they're taking much more. So that's important to know um, mm -hmm. that can be useful. Um, and then kind of the, you know, just always be aware of what the responses are to the medication. So you can tell that to the provider. Yeah. And I think again, on activity too, is the patient, you know, sleeping all day long, um, and so there's really no concern about necessarily um, medication use in terms of um, are they comfortable, but they're not making goals towards getting out of the hospital. Right. Excellent point. I think those are all really good tips. Um, definitely. 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and reach out to um, Kristen or Eddie. I think, do we have some questions from the group that we would like to kind of, um, let me see. Um, yes, I think I have a question here. So this is to all the panelists. Um, has anyone had good success in implementing strategies during the transition um, in acute care? So it uh, looks like, for example, post-cardiac surgery from IVPRNs to PO, uh, POPRNs or like a PCA to PO. So some of those transitional tips. So, I mean, I do, I do that every day, so I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at nauseum every day. So a lot of it is just preparing the patient the minute you start the PCA. This is not something, this is something that um, we're going to do right now while your pain is very acute, but in a day or two, we are going to need to transition over to oral pain medications. And we want to figure that out. And this is how I tell every single patient, they want to go home. You can't go home with IV pain medications or a PCA. And we wanna figure that out. What is gonna make you comfortable before you leave the hospital? We don't wanna stop that IV pain medications and send you out the door and not know that you can't manage your pain without pain medications. So we, I really think it's important to have that conversation the minute you set up the PCA so that they know that there's, they can feel in their mind, they're gonna be working towards oral pain medications. And then one strategy, like if they're really nervous about it is I'll schedule the opioids for 24 hours and then, you know, let them refuse it or the nurses hold it if they're over sedated and then switch to PRN where they can ask for it. A lot of patients are very nervous that when they ask for pain medications, they're not going to get them right away, right? Every, the nurses mm -hmm. have a lot of patients. It's very, you know, it's very stressful. And so then the, pa then the patient gets all worked up like, oh my God, I asked for my pain medicines 20 minutes ago and I still don't have them. So having it scheduled for that 24 hours can sometimes give them that confidence. Yeah, Very good. I yeah, I think yeah. there's, and that's a lot of fear about giving up the PCA, right? Because patients have gotten very, I mean, there's that sweet spot, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that this just takes experience in doing that, like, so setting it up um, initially as a, you know, we're going to go to orals and using orals as much as you can, even in that first 24 hours, if patients can take, can take orals. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, I think if you wind up going two or three days and patients get really comfortable with that PCA, it's that much harder getting them mm -hmm. off of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So also I would like to know if there's some recommendations or what's the most recent literature guidelines um, that we can kind of follow a read up. Um, read up on um, for best practices in pain management. That's one thing that I, one place I would point um, nurses to, um, and because I'm a, a long-term member part, um, and participant and lecturer and have been on the board, mm -hmm. is the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. Mm -hmm. American Society for Pain Management Nursing. Their website has a series of educational um, pieces and topics on white papers, on recommended guidelines around dosing uh, pain medicines to numbers, on doing pain assessment, on how to take care of patients with epidurals, um, some of the more complicated stuff. And it's, it's geared towards the mm -hmm. nurse on the bedside okay. to give guidelines and information. Um, I, th I think that's a great place to start um, and looking at their resources. Uh, um, the nurses uh, have put together some really good content on there. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, yeah. number one. And I, and I would also say as more, again, you see this more in an academic setting, maybe less in regional, unless, you know, you have someone like Michelle that goes out into the sticks and opens up a pain service and brings interventional practices into the, into the department, um, is for bedside nurses to get a lot more familiar. And you could do this at, at regional conferences about um, regional catheters, right? So I think that things like adductor canal catheters, even epidurals, I think the typical bedside nurse gets on the job training, but to be able to really have a more in-depth knowledge of regional anesthesia and how these, you can advocate for your patients to, to get for the physicians to get the um, skills to put these catheters in, but also to know how to trouble, um, you know, solve and how to use these catheters and the benefits to the patients. Even single shots can give you um, a 12 hour window to at least get their pain medicines 
on board and have like a good regimen um, before the before the block wears off. Um, just you know, you both are in the in in the academic centers where the catheters are you know easily asked for, but like at some of the smaller hospitals like I'm at, the skill set might just be a single shot, and yeah. you know. Um, and if that's what you have, take it, man. I will, you know, and then it gives you that 12, like, you know, a good 12 to 24 hours sometimes window just to get their pain medicines kind of aligned. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Also, um, can you remind us again, um, what is the, it looks like the name of the first pain assessment tool we mentioned? Yeah, sure. It looks like Eddie kind of responded, but um, just to repeat that. So the first tool was called Wilda. W-I-L-D-A. Um, the second one I mentioned was Kappa, C-A-P-A. -A. Uh, Wilda is words. John and Tracy Manick, so please leave a message. Thank you. Words, intensity, Sorry. location, duration, and aggravating and alleviating factors. And if you search, do a Google search, you'll come up with Regina Fink, uh, the creator of that, um, and you'll find some articles. Um, the next one was CAPA, C-A-P-A, -A, Clinically Aligned Pain Assessment Tool, Clinically Aligned Pain Assessment Tool. And then another one that I didn't mention that I was actually remembering is, is the F is in Frank, P is in Paul, S, FPS, Functional Pain Scale, which is really more of a chronic pain, um, elderly type tool that they're trying to make changes to to implement in acute care. Those are all good avenues to, to look at. And yes, Kappa has been implemented in some, in some institutions. If you do searches for that, that, art, uh, that um, name, you'll come pull up some articles where people have published about trying to put it into place in their institution. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that recap. Um, so my final question for the group, um, are there treatment alternatives for nerve pain in extremities? That's a great question. I think especially with diabetic populations. <laughs> so I think in the acute care setting, it's really looking at these regional you know, nerve blocks that we talked about. Um, and then again, Michelle did a, did a nice um, kind of overview of the gabapentinoids and, mm -hmm. and, um, and those are used, but there's definitely things that you can do in the ambulatory setting um, to help with that, but that maybe is beyond the scope of this lecture. Yeah, I, I would say it's a it's a hard problem. You know, the there are medications that can attenuate it somewhat, maybe help some. Don't some people they don't help, and those they help some, maybe not enough. Um, and the analgesics all come with side effects. You know, the atypical ones. You know, forget the opioids and those problems. Mm -hmm. You know, your nerve pain drugs and your antidepressants. Um, but it is it is a difficult problem that sometimes needs specialists to be doing uh, the perhaps nerve blocks and or further inner um, uh, diagnostic tools to get at exactly where the pain's right. being generated from to target it. And that's not always available in community hospitals or, or you know, less uh, you know, settings that are not academic centers. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank everybody and all my panelists. Um, you know, Rob, thank you, uh, Michelle and Tracy. I. I, I personally like learned so much um, just being here with you guys today. Uh, it's has really helped me and I'm excited about taking this information back to my colleagues here in Bakersfield. Um, anything that, uh, any final closing words uh, from, you know, um, Eddie or our AHA hosts? Thank you, Valerie. And thank you so much to our panelists for the great discussion today. And thanks for our audience for your thoughtful questions. When you exit this session, a feedback survey will pop up in your browser. You will also receive a follow-up email tomorrow with the survey. The recording from today's panel will be available in the coming weeks at heart.org forward slash pain management. Please be sure to visit this site for additional resources on this topic, future educational opportunities, and to join our mailing list. Thank you very much for attending. This concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody. Bye.